uh, the Lord's hands, and uh, it's good to be able to be back here today. Um, we've got a lot of ground to cover. We've been in the book of John, and we're going to be back there today. Uh, we know that we're within, in this passage, we're within days of the Lord Jesus Christ being crucified. And, and we're going to see in the next few chapters, uh, really him start to try to prepare uh, his disciples for that time. He's got some things he's got to show them. And uh, we've got some pretty interesting chapters coming up. So uh, I hope you've enjoyed the study. I've enjoyed uh, digging into it, I've enjoyed being able to cover it. But we're not quite done with chapter 12. We still got uh, quite a few verses in chapter 12. And so let's go ahead and get back there this morning. John chapter 12. Uh, we are going to cover, uh, I'm going to start in verse 17 just to, to set the context again. And, and then we will kind of dig into all the way down. Hopefully this morning we'll see how it goes all the way down to verse 33. Now, um, before we do, I just want you to take just one second. I'm going to change paths here for a second. That last song that Brother Philip sang was hymn number 104, uh, Rescue the Perishing. I want you to think about it. It really jumped out at me this morning. That last verse says, Rescue the perishing, duty demands it. Strength for thy labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way patiently when them tell the poor wanderer a Savior has died. What jumped out at me this morning was that phrase, Strength for thy labor the Lord will provide. You know, we are supposed to be going out, we are supposed to be telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ, tell them, telling them their need to repent and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not an easy message sometimes to take to people and you don't know how it's going to be received and honestly as time progresses uh, and we get near to the end of the world it's probably just going to get harder and harder and harder right um, but the thing is is the Lord is going to give us the strength if he gives us a work to do he's going to give us the strength to go through it. And some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about here in John, he's got some commands uh, and he's got some lessons for us to learn. And some of those lessons, are, they're going to be a little hard to step out and do those things, right? You know, I'm thinking of a, a chapter or two ahead when uh, he tells them that, you know what, it's the love that you show each other that's going to make people know that you've been with me, to let people know that you're mine right? Well, we're people. We have disagreements. We have different uh, opinions and stuff like that. It can be hard sometimes to come together as a group of people, right? And, and uh, to be in unity. But we need to have that unity in Christ. And he's going to give us the strength to do it if we're willing. And, and that ability to go out and tell others about him. And, uh, to, you know, to tell people that they are sinners <laughs> and that they need a Savior is not an easy message to carry, but it's one that he will give us the strength to do. And I was just encouraged by that, that phrase this morning. And so thanks for giving me, for the patience and giving me the time to talk about that for just a second. Uh, it, the, we really need to pay attention to those songs that we sing. And uh, sometimes the Lord uses those to speak to us and to encourage us, doesn't he? All right, John chapter 12, we're going to read 17 down through verse 33. It starts with this, it says, The people therefore that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world has gone after him. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. And the same came before Philip, which was a Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tells Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. 
He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it until eternal life. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there also my servant be. And if any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And the people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. And others said, An angel spake to him. And Jesus answered and said, The voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Now, I want to take just a little bit of time here. Um, there's a lot more that we that we can cover and need to cover in this chapter, and I realize that I'm backing up just a little bit. Right? We actually read uh, these verses last Sunday. Now we didn't cover them in depth, uh, but we read them, and then we covered some of the verses above it, and we dealt with how the Lord has had his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, right? And they were shouting, Hosanna in the highest. And they were putting their clothes down and the palm leaves down. And and the Lord Jesus Christ was shown great honor and great glory. But he also was fulfilling prophecy as he was coming, riding on this, uh, this colt, the foal of an ass, right? This young donkey. And we talked about how that it was fulfilling prophecy, but it was also showing that the king was coming in gentleness and meekness and humbleness and a king of a king of peace but we also talked about the fact that he came presenting himself as that passover lamb right he came showing himself he literally just came into town it seems went to the temple looked around and then left right well it's after that that we start to see some of this and people are turning to him and the pharisees are they're saying it looks like the whole world is turning to him. And it's, I don't think it's any mistake that after the Pharisees say it's like the whole world is turning to him that you see that these Gentiles, these Greeks, come to the apostles. And they've been some of those that seem to have left the city and came out and, and looked at him. And now, now they're coming to Philip and, and they're saying, hey, you know, we, we, we'd, love to, we'd love to see this one Jesus, right? And you see here in the story that... It's interesting, and the Bible doesn't go into a whole lot of detail, but you see that they come to Philip, which is of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Uh, Philip then comes and tells Andrew, and Andrew and Philip then come and tell Jesus. And you see this whole dialogue. It's almost like you see these Gentiles come, and they say, Hey, hey, Philip, we'd like to to see Jesus. We'd like to meet this one Jesus. And, And Philip, it's almost like, I don't know if he just didn't know what to do with it, right? I mean... To some degree, the disciples had been, you know, when they went out and they were going to go do their stuff, they were kind of, you know, told, don't, don't go to the Gentiles yet, right? But, but here these Gentiles are coming and say, hey, we'd love to see Jesus. Philip goes and gets Andrew. And it's almost, it's almost like you get this impression that Andrew wasn't sure what to do with it either, right? And so Philip and Andrew now come to Jesus. Uh, and it's interesting to me when you read the text, you don't actually necessarily see that Jesus Christ, we aren't told his direct answer about did the Gentiles get to come and see him? Did they they get to talk to him? He doesn't doesn't really, John doesn't really say, right? But I do want you to notice this. I don't think that it's, I don't think it's just that there's this break and there's two stories But Jesus Christ answers them saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now, I happen to believe that the Gentiles starting to come and starting to show interest in this one Jesus was yet another sign that the time of Christ's ministry to come to an end was was taking place. Right? Um, We know that when you look at the Old Testament, it talks about that he's going to be uh, he's going to be a light even to the Gentiles, right? And, and we know that it's through David's seed that even the whole world is going to have access to the Father, right? And so I think as you look at this, the very fact that even these Greeks are now coming and they're saying, hey, we'd like to meet this one Jesus, 
Jesus' response to that, Jesus' response to that statement and that request was, my hour has come, and now is the time that the Son of Man should be glorified. So I want, you to, I want you to think about that. I want you to recognize that, that that's a part of the story. That's part of the fact that it's time for the Son of Man to be glorified. The Gentiles have come and are starting to seek Him. I want you to think also about the statement, the Son of Man shall be glorified. Now the word glorified really kind of brings with it this idea of, of being magnified. Or, or right, it's this... Uh, it's this um, Oh man, it's just this, just, just this great magnification of this one, the Son of Man. But, but I want you to notice, and, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, when we think about being glorified or being magnified or being lifted up, I don't think that's exactly what Jesus Christ is saying here, right? Um, it, it is. But again, so many times the way the Lord looks at things is different than the way we look at things. Many times in the book of John, when, when the Lord is talking about, it's time for me to be glorified. You know what he's actually talking about? He's actually talking about he's going to go back where he came from. Um, as you look at things like, I want you to read just real quick. Let's turn over a few chapters to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. He says this in verse 5. Well, let's back up. We'll read these verses. Starting in verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. He's saying, Lord, I left, I forsook. I forsook all and I came here and I've lived this life and I've fulfilled every commandment that you've given me and I know my hour has come and it's time for me to go back and to be glorified with you once again. Now there's a lot of stuff wrapped up in this. It's not just that he's going back, right? Uh, but he is going to go back to be with the Father. He's going to take back that place of uh, the right hand of the Father, right? And there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of honor and glorification that's, that's done in that. I understand that. But I also understand that the very act of what he's about to do is going to glorify the Father, right? He's fulfilling the commands of the Father. He's doing what the Father has given him to do. That very act is going to glorify the Father. And then he's saying, Lord, then glorify me back with you the way I was before I came here. And so understand that there's a lot of stuff wrapped up uh, in this passage, in, the, in this statement about being glorified. The Lord is not just saying, uh, you know, I'm going to be magnified here on this earth. He's saying it's time that I'm going to finish the work the Father has given me. In doing so, I'm going to glorify the Father. And as I'm going back and I'm crucified and people are going to know who I am and what I've done, I'm going to go back and I'm going to be glorified with the Father the way I was. All right? So there's just a lot of stuff wrapped up in this when he says the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. But this is really, I want you to think about this too, because he didn't just stop there. Um, and all of this is one dialogue as he says this. The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Now, I titled the message, Life from Death. There's, there's a lot of stuff wrapped up in these next few verses. But Jesus Christ has told them the hour has come and the Son of Man is going to be glorified. And in preparation, he tells them, you know what? Much fruit doesn't come unless that seed falls into the ground and dies. He's telling them that, look, I have to die in order for the fruit to come. 
it's such an amazing picture when you look at this. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. You know, Grandma Marie uh, has saved some wheat kernels from years ago. Years ago, right? In the, I think it was probably in the 70s, okay? And as you think about that, you could still dip into that jar and take a kernel of wheat and lay it there on the table, right? It's still there. It, it's, it's fine. It's perfect. It's, it's just a seed. But it's just that. It's, it's just one single kernel of wheat. The amazing thing in the picture that you guys need to think about is that as you take that kernel of wheat, if you were to take that kernel of wheat and bury it in the ground and cover it up, what would happen is that as that ground, as that seed is in the ground and, and it starts to get some moisture, the outside casing of that thing is going to start to decay and the inside of that is going to start to germinate and something's going something's to break that seed apart and start to grow out of that and going to grow out of the ground. It's going to grow up. And you know what's going to happen? How many of you guys, how many of you kids here, as you look in the back of this building, have seen that banner that we have hanging on it and it talks about lift up your eyes and look and it talks about the harvest and there's that that head of wheat that's coming up out of that you know that head of wheat that has a whole bunch of wheat kernels on it it came from one you buried one seed and from that one seed you get a lot of life now I did a little bit of looking, and again, these are averages, right? But what they say is that a single seed of wheat that you plant, from that will grow, a generally, a, a, a stalk of wheat is going to have five heads on it, okay? And each head of wheat is going to have somewhere around 22 kernels of corn, not corn, wheat. So think about it. From one seed comes somewhere around 110 kernels of wheat. It's a picture the Lord is drawing. Now obviously the Lord's death you know, brings a lot more than 110 souls with it, right? But it's just a picture. The Lord Jesus Christ is taking something they will understand. They, all of these men that he's talking to would understand the fact that if you take a single wheat and you bury it and that thing then starts to decay and die and it starts to germinate and this, this plant comes up, you're going to get a lot more from just that one thing. You know, that's what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. The Lord Jesus Christ has said, hey, my hour has come. And he says, you know what? I could stay here. He had every... He was probably a young man. He had more power than anybody. Do you think they could have hung him on the cross if he, if he wasn't willing? No. He'd repeatedly disappeared from the crowd. He'd, dis, he'd just somehow got away. We even know that he could have called angels to protect him. But he tells his disciples, he says, do you know what? He says, unless, unless that seed falls and is buried and dies, no fruit's going to come. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Jesus Christ had already told us in some of the preceding chapters that he was going to go back to be with the Father. He had already even said to some of the rulers that he was going to willingly give his life for his sheep. And now he's telling his disciples, the hour's come. Now's the time. And unless I die, fruit doesn't bear. He goes on as you look at the rest of this and he says, He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it, unto eternal life. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my Father honor. Now the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, is telling them that his hour is come, and he's told them that he's going to die, that people might have eternal life. But then he says, you know, 
If you love your life, you're going to lose it. But if you're willing to sacrifice your life, you're going to gain it. Now the principle here, you know, the principle here, by the way, is not that, look, if a person is willing to die, that will gain them access to heaven. That's not the point. You've you got to take the rest of Jesus' teachings and the things that he said, right? I think you've got to understand here the Lord Jesus Christ is showing an attitude with which his people are going to follow him. He says, look, he says, you know what? If you love your life, if you love your life, you're not going to be willing to do the things that I need you to do. But those that are willing to forsake their life for my cause will gain it. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now, as you look at this verse, I think you take this verse, you take it in context, you take it in uh, reflection of other scriptures. Lord Jesus Christ is saying, look, if you, will, if you will forsake your life, if you will repent of what you are, recognize your sinful condition for me, uh, your sinful condition, and you will believe in me, and you will forsake all and follow me, you'll have eternal life. Now, I think there's that spiritual context. There's also the physical context. We as believers, when Lord Jesus Christ has put stuff out there for us to do, we can look at things in this life and we can say, oh man, but if I do that, I'm not going to be able to do this, and I'm not going to be able to have this, and I'm not going to be able to have that. Are you willing to forsake all that stuff to serve me? Are you willing to forsake that stuff that would make your life better, comfortable, whatever? Are you willing to forsake that in order to follow me? Lord Jesus Christ is saying, look, I'm about, to, I'm about to lay down my life for you. Are you. Are you my follower? Are you willing to follow my example? Are you willing to lay down your life to do the will of the Father? There's just a lot of stuff wrapped up in here. But again, I don't want anybody to take this context and think that it means that, because I know some people do, by the way, I, this does not mean that, look, if you're willing to give your life and die, that means you're going to have entrance into heaven. We know from the scriptures and many other places in Jesus' own words, the only way that you're going to get entrance into heaven, the only way you're going to have access to the Father is if you believe in the Son. Right? You've got to trust in the work of the Son. But Jesus keeps going here and he says, Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? It's kind of a rhetorical question, by the way. But there's a lot of stuff wrapped up in this too. And, I, and don't, don't misunderstand. The, the Father, I mean, the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ here is talking about His hour has come, right? That's the, that's the, that's the topic at hand. He's telling them, my hour has come. I need to die that there might be fruit. If I was to love my life and not forsake it, life wouldn't come. By the way, there's a principle for you there too. Are you willing to forsake your life for me? Now, my hour has come and I'm about to die and that troubles my soul. You know what you see here? you see a little bit of the humanity of Jesus Christ. John focuses a whole lot on the divinity of Jesus Christ. He does. But I have, as I've studied the book of John, because we always think about John being the, the book that talks about the divinity of Jesus, and it does. But you know, there's a whole lot of the humanity of Jesus Christ in John too. A lot. And you see a little bit of that here. He says, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. He says, you know what, guys? I'm about to die. My hour has come, and it's troubling. You know, he knew more than anybody what he was about to suffer. You think about the fact the Lord Jesus Christ, he knew that he was going to be forsaken of some of those that were closest to him. He knew that one of those closest to him was actually going to betray him. And all of the others, even though they weren't the ones that betrayed him, they were going to forsake him. 
He knew that he would be judged. He knew that he would be beaten. He knew that he would be hung on the cross. And he would suffer great physical agony. But also understand that he knew that he'd be forsaken of the Father. As he hung on that cross and he cries out, My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Right? He knew all of that stuff was coming. And it troubled him. Physically, oh man, that's not something you want to go through. But I love the willingness. I want you to see the willingness of the Lord Jesus Christ in this statement. Because you know what he said? He said, should I sit here and say, Father, save me from this hour? That's really what he's asking. He's saying, he says, look, it troubles me. It troubles me. And, and should I sit here and ask, Father, Father, save me from this? Don't, don't make me do this. Is that what I should be asking right now? Should I love my life? Remember the verses that he said, right? Earlier he told his disciples, he that loveth his life shall lose it. He says, look, he says, should I sit here and should I ask the Father for this not to happen? Should I be willing to say, I, I love this life more than I love that? I love how he ends it. He says, but for this cause I came unto this hour. Again, remember, the context is the same. Verse 23 and verse 27, we're still talking about the same thing. We haven't changed topics. Father, save me from this hour? No. He says, this is the reason I came. This is why I'm here. But for this cause came I unto this hour. He's telling his disciples, look, everything that you've seen up to this point has been building to this hour, this time. You know, Philip and Andrew, when you first, when you first met me, you know, Andrew, you think back to some of the earlier verses of John, he could, he could, he could look at Andrew and say, look, Andrew, when you heard John the Baptist first say, behold the Lamb of God, it was building up to this hour. Philip, when you heard about me, when you met me, and when you started telling other people about me, it was building up to this hour. When you saw me turn the water into wine, and when you saw me walk on the water, when you saw me heal the blind, when you saw me raise Lazarus from the dead, all of these things have been building up to this moment. You know, I think to some degree he's preparing them for the fact that here in a little bit he's going to die on a cross. And I think they're going to be shocked. This is not what the people expected. They had just seen him make a triumphant entry into Jerusalem. But now he's telling them, look, the hour's come and that kernel of wheat needs to die in order for there to be fruit. And it troubles me. But I'm willing to forsake this life to follow the will of the Father because this is why He sent me. You see so much about the willingness of the Lord Jesus Christ to follow what the Father has set out for Him to do. And we need to be asking ourselves that same question, right? As you think about this. Now our job, right? We weren't sent to die on the cross to pay for man's sins. We can't do that. But my question for each one of you is are you willing to do whatever the Lord puts in front of you to do? Even if it troubles your soul? Even if you look at it and go, that terrifies me. That scares me to death right there. Are you willing to say, you know what? If that's what the Father wants, that's what I want to do. The Lord Jesus Christ is our example. He is our pattern. And you see his willingness to totally submit to the will of the Father. It's easy to say, I'm willing to do what God wants me to do when we're perfectly comfortable with what God wants us to do. But what about when it troubles your soul? When it troubles your very soul? When you look at it and you go, ah, maybe my first question is, it should be, uh, Father, um, not that. C 
can it be something other than that? Are you willing to set aside that trouble? Are you willing to set aside that fear? Are you willing to set aside your life to say, Lord, if that's what you've put me here to do, that's what I want to do? Are you willing to serve? It's a great picture of how we need to be willing to forsake all if that's what the Lord wants us to do. You know, we fight so hard to keep things in this life. We fight so hard for our comforts. We fight so hard for all of those things to build up to, right? Are we willing to set those things aside if it requires it in order to do what the Lord has asked us to do? We need to be. And when you're afraid, when you're not sure if you can do it, remember what the Lord Jesus Christ did for you. And then you go and you ask Him for strength. Willingness to fulfill the command of the Father. That's what was in front of Him. And that's what He wanted to do. You know, He goes on here in these next few verses and He says, Father, glorify Thy name. He says, this is the hour that I've come for. This is what I've been sent to do. This is the command from the Father. And I'm going to do it. And Father, I want Your name to be glorified through me. Father, you be glorified. Let your name, your authority, you be glorified. And as you look at the rest of these verses, it says, Then there came a voice from heaven saying, I am, I have both glorified. Now, in italics it says it. Uh, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. You know, I think what he's saying here, and I've read several different people on some of this, uh, I think to some degree the Lord is saying, or the, the Father is saying, my name has been glorified through Jesus Christ and His coming and His actions and His life. And I will glorify it again. You, you will glorify the Father. I love that. I just love the way He says it. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. It's interesting when you think about the fact that Jesus Christ a few chapters later says, Lord, glorify me again with you like I had before. He says, I've both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Another said an angel spake to him. And Jesus answered and said, the voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. You know, this is not the first time that that type of terminology, that type of phrasing has been used. Uh, you remember back when he raised Lazarus from the dead, he basically said something similar. This isn't happening. You know, I'm not praying this to the Father for my sake. I already know the Father hears me. I already know the Father's going to answer me. I'm saying this because you need to hear it. He says, you know, the voice that you just heard from heaven that says, I've glorified it and will glorify it again, that wasn't for me. That was for you. You needed to hear that. The voice came not because of my sake, but for your sakes. In verse 31, he says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And if I be lifted up, upon, up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Jesus Christ is in essence, and I'm going to paraphrase this, just my own way of saying it. Um, the, voice, the voice said, you know, I've glorified it, and I'm going to glorify it again. And then Jesus Christ said, look, you heard that voice not for my sake, but it was for your sakes. And he says, you know what, you need to understand something. When I say the hour has come, when I say the Son of Man is going to be glorified, you need to understand this is the beginning of the end for the prince of this world. What looks like defeat is actually the beginning of the end for the ones that are wrong. This is about to be the time when judgment comes. Now Jesus Christ came into this world to save the world, right? He came to save it. And His death that's about to happen, His hour of glorification, His hour that has come, is going to accomplish that work that needed to be done. But understand that the Lord Jesus Christ dying on the cross is also 
to some degree, the beginning of judgment for those that reject, right? There's going to come a time, there's going to come a time when people stand before the Lord and the very things that the Lord declared while He was here on this life, in this life, and the very act that He did, He's going to point to those things and say, did you believe me? Did you trust in me? I died on the cross. Judgment has come. And now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Jesus Christ is telling them, look. He says, the, sun, the hour's come. It's time to die. It troubles me. But it's what I need to do. It's why I'm here. And he goes on and he says, this is the beginning of the end for the prince of this world. And he says, you know what, if I'm not lifted up, in essence he's saying, look, I need to be lifted up. And me being lifted up, all men are going to be drawn to me. Not, not literally in regards to all men, but this is saying, look, this, this is the path of redemption. I need to be lifted up and then will draw men unto me. Do you remember what it said in the very beginning of John? Jesus Christ here is actually repeating something that was said about him in the very beginning. This had to be lifted up like that brazen serpent in the wilderness, right? Jesus Christ here wasn't saying be lifted up in the way of saying, I need to be glorified, I need to be magnified. Not in the, not in the terms of mankind. He was saying, I need to be lifted up and sacrificed. I'm going to die, and I'm going to die, and then all men will be drawn to me. There could be some reference here. I can't swear to it, but there could be some reference here. It's interesting to me that he ends this statement with saying, we'll draw all men unto me. Remember what the context is. The Gentiles have come to the apostles wanting to see Jesus, and his response is, the hour has come, I'm going to die, and being lifted up, all men are going to be drawn unto me. I don't think it's any mistake that the Lord Jesus Christ says that as part of his response to the Gentiles coming and saying they want to see Jesus. Remember, that's the question he was answering. It signaled that his time was near. He took that opportunity to try to prepare them once again for what was coming. He gave them some advice about needing to be willing to forsake this life. Told them what he was going to do. Gave us a great example of willingness to serve even when terrifies us. And then said, my death is going to cause all men to be drawn unto me. I can't help but wonder if they didn't think about that statement later when Cornelius was saved. And then they started to hear some of the things about Paul and how he was having such success with the Gentiles. Lord Jesus Christ gave his life that we might have abundant life. Thankfully, praise the Lord, that's not something that was only for the nation of Israel. That's not only something that was for those that were converted to Judaism. It was for all nations and all tongues. It means me. It means you. Lord Jesus Christ here told them he was about to perform the work that was required in order for men to be able to stand before a holy and a just God. It says there in verse 33, This he said, signifying what death he should die. If there's any mistake, Apostle wants to, when John finishes this, if there's any mistake, he wants them to know what that phrase meant. Jesus Christ wasn't saying, I'm going to be magnified. I'm not, he didn't mean I'm going to be lifted up as a king. He said, oh, understand, the Lord Jesus Christ was talking about how he was going to die. 
He was going to be lifted up off the earth on a cross and die for my sins that I might have redemption. There's a lot of stuff in this chapter here. But I just want you to think about this as we close. And we are done. But I want you to think again of the willingness of the Lord Jesus Christ to serve the Father. Are you willing? When it troubles your heart, when it troubles your soul, are you willing? You know, the analogy was about him dying on the cross and, and the one dying that the many might have life. But, you know, there's also a practical principle to that. If you don't go out and do the work, right, you, the Lord has given you something to do. You need to go and you need to do it. If you want to see fruit, you've got to do the work. Are you willing? Are you willing to go and are you willing to do what the Lord Jesus Christ has asked you to do? All right, Brother Philip, would you come and lead us in the song of invitation, please? And as